Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending Foundation Software's Affordable Care Act webinar. We will be reviewing some high-level ACA information. And then address questions at the end of the presentation. My name is Stacy Kazarvich, and I will be your host. I am a business analyst at Foundation Software, and for the past seven years have been the point person for clients that sign up for our ACA service. Additionally, Denise Hearn from Sales, who has been handling our ACA service since its inception, is joining us as well. And she will help us navigate your questions at the end of the presentation. So you are aware this webinar is being recorded. You, our, our participants, have been muted, but you can send questions via chat. Again, after the presentation, we will address as many questions as possible. Okay, so let's dive in. So the Affordable Care Act contains benefits and responsibilities for employers as well as a benefit for individuals that purchase health coverage through the health insurance marketplace. So for small employers, which are generally employers with fewer than 50 employees, they may be eligible for credits and other benefits. And then large employers, which are generally employers with 50 or more employees, they are defined as an applicable large employer, or an ALE, and two provisions of the ACA apply to ALEs. Those are the employer shared responsibility and the employer information reporting provisions. And then for individuals, if an individual was not eligible for affordable coverage through an eligible employer-sponsored plan, then that individual may be able to claim a premium tax credit on their income tax return. Okay, a quick overview of the ACA forms. So there is the A form, which is furnished to individuals by the health insurance marketplace to report that the individual was enrolled in a qualified health plan. And then there's the B form, the B forms are furnished by a health insurance provider, such as Aetna or Cigna, to report individuals that are enrolled in their health coverage. And then the C forms. The C forms are furnished by ALEs to report the employer's offer of health insurance coverage to their employees. And generally, a 1095C form is furnished to only full-time employees. And then just as a side note for the B form, if um, a small employer is self-insured, meaning they self-insure, self-fund, self-administer their health insurance, um, they can use the B form to report the individuals that enrolled in their self-insured coverage. So the burning question is, am I an ALE, an applicable large employer? So employers must determine their ALE status each calendar year based on the average size of their workforce during the prior year. So employers with 50 or more full-time employees, including full-time equivalent employees during the prior year, are considered an ALE for the current calendar year. So if in 2022, you had 50 or more employees on average, then you're an ALE for 2023. So full-time employees are those that have at least 130 hours in a month. So the IRS instructions for the um, state that an employee is full-time if they have 50 hours in a week, excuse me. <laughs> the IRS states that a, an employee that has 30 hours in a week is considered full-time, and then they do translate that to 130 hours in a month. And then employees that have less than 130 hours in a month are aggregated into a full-time equivalent count. 
And then do be aware that employees with medical coverage through the military are not counted toward the 50 employee threshold. And then additionally, an employer may not be an ALE if the seasonal worker exemption applies to them. Okay, so one thing to be aware of are aggregated ALE groups. So companies with a common owner or that are otherwise related under certain rules of Section 414 of the Internal Revenue Code are generally combined and treated as a single employer for determining ALE status. So if the combined number of full-time employees and full-time equivalent employees for the group meets the definition of an ALE, then each employer in the group is part of the aggregated ALE group and considered an ALE. So for example, if you have three companies that each have 20 full-time employees and all three companies fall under common ownership, then your aggregated employee count is 60. So that makes each company an ALE member of the aggregated ALE group, and then each company must comply with the ACA provisions. So one of the first steps in determining if you're an ALE is figuring out your average employee count, your average employee workforce. So Foundation's monthly hours detail report can help you determine your ALE status. So in Foundation and payroll in the ACA payroll reports in the ACA section, we have a monthly hours detail report. And this report <clears throat> looks for posted hours. So if an employee has posted payroll but no posted hours, then it looks at the employee's full-time or part-time status on the employee record and reports a predetermined number of hours accordingly. So for instance, if you have a full-time salaried employee that does not have to have hours and they had posted payroll in the month of January, that employee would be reported 100, with 173.33 hours on a monthly detail report. If there are hours, then those hours are reported for the employee. So the um, summary of the report will give you a full-time employee count. So any of those employees that hit the 130 hours or more making them full-time are counted in this full-time employee row. And then any of your employees that fall below the 130 those employees are aggregated into a full-time equivalent employee count. The two numbers are added together to give you your total full-time and full-time equivalent employee count. You add these numbers together and divide by 12 to get your average um, employee count for the year that you ran the report. So again, Foundation's monthly hours detail report can help you determine your ALE status. So if you've determined that you're an ALE and have to comply with the provisions of the ACA, one of those provisions being the shared responsibility, which is your, essentially falls under your offers of coverage, um, an ALE may choose to either offer affordable minimum essential coverage that provides minimum value to its full-time employees and their dependents or potentially owe an employer shared responsibility payment to the IRS. So affordability can be determined using a form W-2 wages, a rate of pay, or the federal poverty line safe harbor. And then a minimum essential coverage provides specific ACA defined services such as preventative services, hospital care, pediatric services, and prescription drug coverage. And then minimum value is provided if the plan is designed to cover at least 60% of the total costs of benefits expected to be incurred. So do note that for purposes of ACA offers of coverage, a spouse is not considered a dependent 
and offering coverage is specific to full-time employees. So knowing that an ALE must offer coverage to their full-time employees, you need a way to determine who your full-time employees are. So an employer can identify their full-time employees using one of two methods. So the first method is called the monthly measurement method. So an employee is identified as a full-time employee on a month-by-month -month basis by looking at the employee's hours each month. And then there's also the look back measurement method. So a certain period of time is used to measure the employee if the employee is full-time employee. And then if that employee is deemed full-time, then the employer has a certain period of time to administer the offer of coverage to the employee. And then the employee's stability period begins with the offer of coverage effective date. So within foundation, we do offer some functionality to manage the look back measurement method. So in the payroll control area of foundation, you can set up measurement groups where you would indicate your measurement period, your administrative period, and then the employee stability period. And then Foundation provides some different reports that allow you to track your employees and help you determine if that employee is going to be considered full-time or part-time. Um, so do keep in mind that Oops, hang on. <laughs> so do keep in mind that the monthly measurement method does not require any setup in foundation. And it is commonly used by employers that simply have a waiting period prior to the offer of coverage. So for instance, most of the clients that I work with, they hire an employee and the intent of that employee is for them to be full time and they might have like a 60-day waiting period before their offer of coverage. So that essentially falls under this monthly measurement method. So again, you don't have to do any special setup and foundation if you're following that path. So it's only if you are truly looking at um, using this look back measurement period because you're not sure if your employee is gonna be full-time and you wanna track their hours and you know use this, you know, it, measurement, administrative, and stability um, periods under the look back measurement method, then foundation can help you manage that. Okay, the other part of being an ALE is to comply with the information reporting provision. So on an annual basis, ALEs must report the offer of coverage information to their employees and to the IRS. So the information is integral to the administration of the shared employer shared responsibility provisions, as well as the premium tax credit. And then ALEs must comply with information reporting regardless of whether the ALE offers health insurance coverage. And ALEs with 10 or more information returns must file electronically. And then an ALE that fails to comply with the information reporting requirements may be subject to the general reporting penalty provisions. So just a quick comment on this first bullet point that references the premium tax credit. So as an, an ALE, you do need to file your 1095Cs reporting your offer of coverage. And one of the things that the 1095C helps the IRS do is to determine if a taxpayer is claiming the premium tax credit even though they had an offer of affordable coverage. So it is paramount to you being an ALE, you need to complete, distribute, file your 1095Cs so that you don't fail to comply with reporting provisions, but just so you are aware, it does help the IRS understand um, if taxpayers are uh, taking this premium tax credit by accident or on purpose by accident. <laughs> anyway, 
Another item to take a look at is this bullet point indicating the 10 or more information returns. Um, so as most of you are probably aware, the mandatory e-filing requirement has been 250 or more information returns. And they did finally push through to reduce that number to 10 or more. And then also just be aware that that 10 or more information returns is an aggregated count. Um, so for instance, if you have 10 or more W-2s, 1099s, 1095s, there's a spattering of other forms that are included in that aggregate. If you have 10 or more forms in aggregate, all of those forms must be filed electronically. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the Form 1095-C. So the Form 1095-C is furnished to the ALE's full-time employees and filed with the IRS. So part two is where you report your offer of coverage to your employee, so the part two. So line 14 of, 10, of the 1095-C form reports your offer of coverage. So this is what was offered, not necessarily what the employee enrolled in. And then for certain line 14 codes, line 15 is required. And note that line 15 reports the employee's monthly contribution for the lowest cost cell phone coverage, not necessarily what the employee paid. And then line 16, um, I kind of call it a postscript to line 14. It, it's a line that you can use to kind of report a little bit more information. So for example, for union employees, you would report no offer of coverage on line 14 since you don't offer health insurance directly to union employees. Then on line 16, you can report code 2E to explain why you did not offer coverage directly to those union employees. So keep in mind that you must provide a 1095C to your full-time employees, and do be aware that there is a tip in the IRS instructions that state that for reporting purposes, an employee in a waiting period is not considered a full-time employee. So my understanding of that would be you hire somebody with the intent of them being full-time. Maybe you have a 60-day waiting period. The employee terminates their employment with you after 30 days, so they never get to that point of an offer of coverage. Um, again, my, my understanding is that employee, for reporting purposes, is not considered full-time, and that employee may not need a 1095C generated for them. So another part of the Form 1095-C is this Part 3, which reports covered individuals. And do be aware that this Part 3 is required only if the employer provides self-insured coverage. So again, your self-insured, self-administered healthcare coverage. You're not working through a United Healthcare or a Medical Mutual, a Cigna. Um, so instead of issuing a 1095-C form to your employee and a 1095-B form to your employee, so the 1095 reports covered individuals, those self-insured ALEs can use the 1095-C to both report the offer of coverage as well as the covered individuals. Okay, so for Form 1095-C, those can be generated out of foundation, and they are generated out of foundation based on the employee maintenance record containing 1095C data for the year being generated. So there's a 1095C tab on the employee maintenance record, and again, you can enter data directly into the employee maintenance record, or we also have a worksheet which can be used to save data to one or more employee maintenance records. So for instance, if you have a number of employees that will be getting the same data on their 1095C form, you could indicate those employees, enter the 1095C data, and then when you click OK, it's gonna save this data 
to the 1095C tab for those indicated employees. So again, you can enter data directly into the employee maintenance record. You can delete the data, revise the data within the employee record, but we also have the worksheet that allows you to um, save data to one or more employees um, records. Just kind of a nice conduit to kind of like do what you might want to call like a bulk upload or a bulk save. And then also within foundation, we have an employee 1095C detail report. So as you're entering or when you're done entering 1095C data, you can run this report and it's a nice way to spot check the data that you've entered for your employees and spot check the employees that will be getting a form. Um, one thing to be aware of is we do have the hours, this hours line on the report, and this is simply reporting um, the hours for the employee for the month, just as you would see on the monthly hours report. Um, this does not translate to the 1095C form. This is not reported on the 1095C form. It's just included here, informational only. Um, it's just kind of a nice way to help you, you know, kind of double check the information you've entered for your employees. And then there is the form 1094C. So this form is furnished to the IRS and it does go along with the 1095C forms. And so this is essentially a cover sheet that contains information about the employer, somewhat similar to the W-3 that is sent with the W-2s. So in foundation, we do have what we call a wizard and that walks through each step required to generate the 1094C and the 1095C forms. Foundation also provides the XML file that's needed for IRS e-filing. So to file ACA information with the IRS, be aware that you have to have a transmitter control code in a TCC. And do be aware that this TCC is specific to the AIR portal. So the, um, da, 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 AIR, the ACA information returns portal. So you may have a TCC for the FIRE portal, but that cannot be used with the AIR portal. You do have to um, apply for and get a TCC specific to the AIR portal to be able to e-file your 1094 and 1095 C forms. Once you do get your AIR TCC, do be aware that you need to submit a test file to the IRS they will approve that, and then once you're approved, your transmitter control code is you know, flipped to a status of production. That's when you're able to use the AIR system and e-file your ACA forms. That is it for our overview. So I appreciate your time today and hope you found this information helpful in getting acquainted with the Affordable Care Act and some of the forms and how foundation can help. So do keep in mind that your health care administrator, CPA, or legal counsel can be a valuable resource to help determine more specific ACA information that applies to your company. So we will now move on to questions and answers. So I'm going to pass it over to Denise. Hello, everyone. I am going to go through the questions and uh, read the more common ones. Um, also, I will um, let you know that, you know, Stacy does head up our ACA service, which is an optional service that um, you can pay us to have help with Stacy. Then we would print stuff, mail um, your ACAs to your employees, and then we would also use our own TCC code to file to the IRS. So you would no longer need to uh, get a TCC code if you hired us to do it. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, feel free to reach out to me um, at client sales at foundationsoft.com. Uh, let's, so Stacy, I do get asked this all the time and it's a question in here that just maybe if you could expand a little bit on, because people do get really confused on if your union employees have to receive 
a 1095C? Um, my understanding is the answer is yes. So the IRS states that you need to give a 1095C form to each of your full-time employees. So keeping in mind, you hire somebody out of the hall, they work for two hours or two days and they leave. If they don't hit that full-time employee definition, you probably don't need to give that particular union employee a 1095C form. But to kind of you know further elaborate, you're hiring that union employee um, you're directing their work, you're giving them a W-2 for all intents and purposes, they're an employee of yours. And so they should be getting a 1095C from you. And the IRS does actually provide very specific codes for the 1095C for those employees that are not getting offered coverage by you because they're getting their offer of coverage from the union. It's called the multi-employer interim rule. Um, so yes, my understanding is union employees count towards your employee count. If you're an ALE, they're considered a full-time employee and they should be getting a 1095C. Okay, somebody asked if they're with payroll for construction, uh, will they be filing their ACAs? Um, so that would be no, they don't automatically file that for you you would have to opt in to our ACA service just because they will not, P4C will not know if you're an ALE and if you need them filed. Not all our P4C clients need to file ACAs. So therefore it is an optional service and you would need to opt into that. Um, let's see here. Uh, so similar question, somebody asked if foundation files it. Um, so that would be if you pay for our service, yes, we can file it for you. Um, otherwise, you'd be responsible for filing ACAs on your own. Uh, okay, so information to require about the 1095 service, our ACA service. So that would be client sales at foundationsoft.com. Or you can call our 800 number, 800-246-0800 and ask for Denise Hearn. Uh, what other questions can you use? So Stacey, do you know where they would need to apply for a TCC code? Um. I don't know the spot offhand, and I've got my computer all locked up for the webinar. <laughs> if you simply Google IRS AIR, A I R T C C, um, it you know you, sh you should like you know the first or second return should have you um, pointed towards yeah. the web page, so, the IRS web page. So unfortunately, we have our own here, and we've had one for <clears throat> many many years. So it's not something we've had a go into and acquire a TCC code in many years. So I'm sorry, we don't necessarily have the answer for that one. Um, so will the slides be available? This was recorded, um, It will, a recording will be sent to you. So you will receive this webinar that we did. Um, I do have to say some of these questions people are asking are more detailed and would need to be um, through our service, unfortunately, that would be something you need to sign up for our service and do like a one on one with Stacy to get some of these questions answered. Um, and unfortunately, our support team will not have answers to specific ACA questions. Our support team supports the software and knows how to get you to areas of the software and answer those questions, but it's a specific about how you code an employee or do something specific relating to the government side of the ACAs. Our support team would not know the answers to that, but that would be something you'd want to sign up for our service for and get help with. Um, just, I'm just going to... Um, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to interject there. So, you know, as with so many things, um, if you sign up for the service and 
you know, we chit chat, you know, I, I, Stacy, you know, just like support or anyone else in foundation, I'm not going to tell you which codes to use. Um, but I can help you explain when certain codes are used in certain um, instances. Um, there's a lot of, you know, like the IRS loves to do, they have lots of layers to their rules. Um, so I can kind of give you some direction of my understanding of the codes. Um, but it is still your filing. And so what a lot of clients will do is, you know, after speaking with me and, you know, getting a better understanding, um, they will then go to their healthcare administrator to kind of get, you know, fine tune, um, you know, what, how they need to, you know, do the reporting. Um, somebody asked where the 1095C wizard is. Um, yep, that is in payroll reports. We have an ACA section. And then within that ACA section, um, there's a section titled IRS reporting, and then it's called form 1094C, 1095C. And so that form 1094C, 1095C underneath that IRS reporting underneath the ACA section, um, that's the wizard. Does foundation track the hours automatically for any union and enter it into the 2E code for each, or do we need to add them to the worksheet? Um, so there isn't what I'm going to call an easy button for coding. Um, one of the reasons is because, you know, every you know, employer, there, there might be a story to an employer and, and who they need to report or the employee and who needs to be reported. So there is not what I'm going to say, an easy button that goes and looks at the hours and looks at the employee record and dumps in those codes. Um, the monthly hours report will help you determine who needs to be reported. And then the worksheet can help you save data to the employee record for those employer employees that need to be reported. So long story short is if you have union employees um, you know that 2e code yes you have to you have to enter the data for those employees again through the worksheet if you have many union employees that would be getting the same 2e code um, or through the employee record and so unfortunately that's all the time we have for questions we're five minutes over the webinar um, so like we said, if you're interested in our service, please feel free to reach out to us and there will be a recorded session of the session sent to you via email. And Stacy, thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. No problem. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Hope it was helpful. Have a great day. Enjoy your day. Bye. Bye.